Thank you. Thank you so much. It has been 10 years. It started the nonprofit in 2006. And over the past 10 years, we've helped over 21,000 women while they were battling cancer get their home clean completely for free. Thank you. And your applause is actually for the maid services that are in the program. We've recruited over 1,200 maid services all across the United States and in Canada to give back in their local communities to women who have cancer. And you know, I was thinking as everyone has been sharing and getting real and talking about struggles and a lot of you women in this room, you see the 10 years of success. I mean, I've been featured in Reader's Digest and Today.com and CNN Money and you know, dozens and dozens of TV interviews and hundreds of radio and newspaper and blog interviews. And sometimes women see that and they feel like, well, I need to step it up. <laughs> or I've, I've had a lot of women come to me and say, Debbie, I've had this idea and this heart for a nonprofit. I'm thinking about starting it. Uh, what do you think? And what I like to say is, where are you in your business today? Is your business successful? Have you gotten your business to the level of success that you wanted it to be? Is it providing the income you wanted it to be? Because starting a nonprofit is starting a business. It just doesn't benefit you personally, it benefits the public. So when you start a nonprofit, you are starting another business. And if you're not ready to start another business, roll up your sleeves and give that new business 110% then you need to finish building the business you're in before you go and dilute your efforts and build something else that might not get to the level of success that you want it to get to. So I would be remiss to just talk about all the wonderful things and all of the success that seems like an overnight success, what a great idea. It took me 35 years to create a successful nonprofit, even though the nonprofit's only been around for 10 years. And that is I have four other businesses that thrive and have staff that run them. Otherwise, I would not have the freedom to devote to the nonprofit cleaning for a reason. And when I started this thing 10 years ago, it wasn't all rosy. And I, you know, was licking my wounds and woe is me. And somebody told me one time, if you want to be liked by everyone, because I like to be liked, if you want to be liked by everyone, just come in second. And that is not me, and I know that is not you in this room, right? You want to be liked by everyone? Just come in second. And then you learn to surround yourself by people who are authentic, who are really in your corner, and will lift you up when you're down, and will not undermine things when you're not looking, and will help you build something great, whether it's your business, or your personal life, or your nonprofit. So cleaning for a reason, fast forward 10 years, has enjoyed a tremendous amount of success, but it wasn't without a lot of tears, a lot of sweat, a lot of grit, and giving it 110%. And so people think when you start a nonprofit, oh wow, the money will flow in, and people will line up to give you money hand over fist. We have Swiffer, Walmart, Staples, Ford Motor, we have a lot of big companies giving us a lot of money. But guess what? No one lines up to give you money when you're a nonprofit. You have to beg for every penny you get, and then you gotta go back next year and beg for it again. And there's no guarantee that if you sponsor you this year, they'll sponsor you next year. So if you are considering a nonprofit that you would like to support, this is tangible, practical help today. And I agree, we need those nonprofits that rake in millions that are helping people that will benefit 30 years from today. But if your aunt or your mother or your sister or your assistant, like Linda was sharing with me, is battling cancer, this is practical help today. So if you'd like a nonprofit that you would like to support that's making a very big difference in a personal way, please go to cleaningforreason.org and just sign up to be on a regular donation schedule. $10 a month, $25 a month, $100 a month, $1,000 a month, whatever you can do, we need your help. And so do these women that are battling cancer. Thank you. Beth Bowman is president and CEO of the Greater Irving Las Colinas Chamber of Commerce, representing more than 1,800 businesses. She promotes economic growth and advocates for public policies. 
that help the business community. She's a graduate of Baylor, for all you Baylor fans out there. And Debbie Sardone, who has been on GMT a couple of times, is the founder of Cleaning for a Reason. It's a nonprofit that has helped more than 12,000 women with cancer get free house cleaning. How about that? She also owns several businesses, including Buckets and Bows Maid Service, the Clean Team Catalog, and the Speed Cleaning brand of products. So welcome to you all. Thank you for being here. And I'm going to take a seat and talk, because I don't want to stand up here and talk the whole time. <laughs> so first of all, I'd like to ask each of you just kind of, I think most, most of us are not where we thought we would end up. Mayor, are you? <laughs> no. <laughs> Just quickly, how did you end up? I had a mom who said, don't do that, because if you ever run for public office, somebody will find out. <laughs> and I remember looking at her going, I'm never going to run for public office, mom. And then, you know, look what happens. How did you end up doing what you're doing, Debbie? I started cleaning houses out of the trunk of my car to supplement a police officer's income. Really? Had no idea it would turn into one of the largest maid services in the country. And when was that? How long ago was that? That was back in the 80s, like 81. OK. Yeah. I was in the sports industry volunteering for the five-star Greater Irving Las Plinas Chamber of Commerce <laughs> as a member. Uh, so maybe at the right place at the right time or the wrong place at the wrong time, depending on the day. Um, but I have not looked back. And today I look forward to sharing with others that you can have a career um, in the Chamber of Commerce industry. OK, well, we're going to talk about leadership first. And I want to know from each of you uh, whether you're the leader of your family, the leader of your company, you want to be a community leader, whatever it is, what's the one most important characteristic you can bring into being successful as being a leader? I'd say positive energy. And what do you mean by positive energy? Anybody like, give me an say, example. Anybody can say, no, this isn't going to work, and this is why it's not going to work. No, no. But it, I think it takes a special kind of people follow others that are positive and that are energetic, that want to get stuff done. And um, people kind of tend to wait. It's, it makes people fun to work with. It makes people, if you have a vision, you can explain the vision. And if you're engaging, people want to listen to that vision. They want to follow you. Um, and I think it's really important that it, no matter what kind of a day you're having, I don't care how bad it is, you have to keep up that positive energy flow. If for nobody else in yourself, you know, we, we've all had those days, but if for nobody else in yourself. And clarity. Without clarity, people are confused. They don't know what you do or how you do it or how to follow you. So you have to have clarity, but you can't just be clear. You have to have passion. So I think those two things, when you're a leader, clarity, so people know what to follow and if they're a good fit, and then passion, so they're excited and they want to follow you. Okay, well, let me ask you a couple of questions about that. How do you get clarity? Because it's not that easy. <laughs> It, well, it so isn't per, that easy. Personally for you, what have you done to get clarity about what your vision is, and then how do you convey clarity? And give me a Keep concrete example. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. If it's so complicated you can't explain it in one sentence, it's probably not even clear in your own head. So when I introduced the idea of cleaning for a reason, I came up with this pink cancer ribbon, which has a universal appeal, and the words cleaning for a reason going through the cancer ribbon. It was so simple, it was so clear. And people kept giving me suggestions which would have pulled away from the clarity. Well, don't you want to help maybe men and don't you want to help maybe Alzheimer's patients and what about right. family whose children are battling cancer? I had a very clear vision and a very clear mission and I wanted to keep it simple. Anybody who saw the logo, they got it, especially if they knew I owned a cleaning service. They got it. It was instantly clear and then my passion helped them understand well, what to do with that clear vision. That's sort of like we say in TV, there's a saying called see it, say it, which means that's the reason that a lot of times the words you hear come out of an anchor's mouth. You see the graphic behind them that says the very same thing, but it's exactly what you're saying. It's clarity. It's simplicity. It's and easy visual, to understand. Visual. Okay, Beth? Uh, commitment. Commitment to the mission, commitment to the organization is a quality that leaders have to have. Uh, Align with commitment is trust. And you build that trust through activities with your internal customers, your team, your external customers, with your stakeholders. Uh, for the organization, I have the pleasure to lead. It's with our member investors. It's with our community partners. As leaders, you have access to so much information. 
And that access is really powerful. And it's very tempting, especially with social media these days, to share that. Uh, but sometimes uh, it's not appropriate. And you need to make sure to know what information to share, when to share it, with whom to share it, and the context to share it. Also in terms of the commitment. If today you're working for an organization and for a company and you don't believe in the mission, reflect back, is that where you want to be? Because for each and every one of you in this room, there's an organization or a company for you to work for and day in and day out, when you're committed to a mission or an organization as a leader, it doesn't become a, a job. It becomes very natural, authentic, as some of our other speakers have shared on this stage. Um, for business people, why is it important to your business and in a larger sense to be a leader in the community? I would go back to trust. I mean, from a business perspective in Irving, we have the privilege of having a business portfolio that communities work hard for every day. So it's really important for us to maintain our businesses and our community. And, and what they mean in terms of leadership is in crisis situations, um, in successful celebratory moments, the leaders are there, they're present. They have communicated the message beforehand. Sometimes uh, the message isn't always positive. And those business leaders are just expecting the outreach, the upfront, here is the situation, we want you to have the facts, we want you to understand our position, and you continue to move forward. Mayor, in your opinion, why is it, why is it important for businesses uh, to, to be community leaders in, in I think sense? It, I think it makes them authentic. I mean, they are, if, if you are um, based in the community, it gives you longevity. Um, it, it makes you, it's not just you're there for the money, right? but you're there because you want to be a member of that community. And it's one of those things, people want to help others that are helping. And I think when you look at businesses, the ones that, that are most successful through our chamber and most successful in our cities are those that are a fully engaged in the community. It's not just from an advertising perspective, but I think it helps them to get engaged with other CEOs and with other members of the community. But the other thing that it does is it allows their employees an opportunity to get engaged. Um, and, and a lot of the employees we see have passions. Um, they want to help a specific group. And when the company gets behind them, they're not just supporting their local community, but they're, they're supporting their own employee base. Well, and when, so and I, when I'm going to ask you about that, Debbie. You've got specific experience with yeah, that. Yeah, when businesses step up and decide, I'm going to be a leader in my community, number one, it puts pressure on their peers. It, causes their peers to think, well, what am I doing and could I be doing more and shouldn't I be doing more? From a practical standpoint, leaders in business are the most visible. It does help you with longevity and sustainability. People aren't going to forget you. You can rattle off, off a list of things that you do in business, that those features that Bob talked about, or you can be known for the good and, and the, the great things that you do to help others. And when you're known for helping others as a business leader, you can't outgive giving. It, it's going to come back tenfold. So it does put pe pressure on your peers. And I also think as entrepreneurs, it's personally rewarding. You know, it's kind of lonely being an entrepreneur. You're building your business and you have so many challenges and trials. You need something that's kind of personally rewarding. So we talked about this a little bit this morning. Being an entrepreneur, being a business person is very, very difficult. And there are times when you reach real low points. So. Sometimes does your, what you do for the people you do it for, the people who have cancer, is that what gets you through? You know, the sometimes times? doing your mission actually can also get you down to the dumps. And I remember I, for a period of time during the early days of my foundation, I kept focusing on all the women we couldn't help, all the women we were turning away. And it kept weighing on me that, wow, thousands of women are applying for this help and we can't help them. And it was beginning to bother me. And I would hear stories of women with four children battling cancer. We did not have a cleaning company in their area. And a man from the Komen Foundation, I'll never forget this, gave us some advice. And his name was Dr. Kuman from Komen. And that's why I'll never forget <laughs> that Dr. Kuman from Komen said, Debbie, you cannot focus on all the people you can't help. You have to focus on all the ones you can. And that really changed my perspective 
about letting it kind of pull me down when I'm reminded that there are millions of women with cancer, but only, you know, thousands of opportunities to help. Mayor, um, people in here are perhaps looking to cross over from one side to the other, from private to public sector work, trying to integrate the two. What qualities you worked you worked in the private sector for how long before I, I still work in the private sector <laughs> my, my, my job pays me twelve hundred dollars a month so how many people really are looking to come over to the public sector <laughs> <laughs> they but they have to work more. with the public sector in yes, a lot of ways and absolutely. what skills do you have from the private sector that are most applicable to being successful in the public sector and let's say you're a corporate person who needs to work with the public sector what are the skills that are the best? I think being sincere. I think people can see through fake, like that. Uh, and I think that hurts you as a politician. It also hurts you as a business person. If people don't believe what you're saying because you're somehow insincere, you're just doing it to make the buck, you know, nobody's going to want to follow you or do, or do business with you. Um, I think having a, a clarity of, of, of a vision where you are actually able to get into a, a mode where you're focused you're able to take input, but you don't lose your focus because it happens so easily. You know, when you're moving towards something, all of a sudden somebody will come in and they'll just derail you and then you'll go this way and then you'll go this way. And before you know it, you have no idea what the goal is. Everybody's working, but they're not doing anything. Um, I think the other thing working in the private sector, what helped in the public sector, is you realize that for every decision you make, while you might make somebody happy, you're going to tick somebody else off. And it's okay. Because if you're ever going to get anything done, it is going to entail ticking some people off. But you're either going to be successful or you're going to be a failure. And that will, I hate to say it, but you do have to, you do have to ruffle a few feathers to get anything done. Working in the private sector helped me figure that out. And realizing it's okay. I mean, at the end of the day, it's not the number of people that like you, but it's the number of things that you can actually accomplish that will speak for you, not you know, people saying nice things about you. Um, we're here to talk about sharing, and we're going to get to questions in just a second, but we're, we're here to talk about sharing the powerful. And being a powerful woman is a unique thing to be in some ways. Um, it, it's, it's, and, and I mean powerful in the sense that you're out there representing a business or you're out there uh, taking what has traditionally been a man's role in some ways. Even today it is. What have you found to be the most challenging part of being a powerful woman in your personal life? Well, I think it's a compliment to say that you're a powerful woman. And just remember, each one of you in here are in the men and just be very cautious with the power um, that you're provided. I would also share the most challenging piece of that is um, from the minute you leave your, your home, you're on. You don't get to, I don't get to take off that I work for the five star Greater Irving Las Cleanest Chamber of Commerce. One it's more time. with me. Do you like that plug? It's like if I had Gatorade up here, right? <laughs> Product placement. Um, well, I'm very proud, but I'm very proud of our, our mission. So, day in and day out, businesses have to decide they want to be a part of their local chamber. Um, it's not my organization, it's our members, it's our community, and I take that very seriously. So for the companies that we serve, from some of the largest companies running our global economy to the entrepreneurs and the small businesses on our Heritage Main Street, we have to serve them and represent them every day. And so what that means is you're on, you got your chamber cheeks on, or you're very um, articulate when you have to deliver some not so great news. There are moments in time where life happens and you're attending a funeral for somebody you might not know, but because they were connected to your organization, you're there, you're present. It's part of the job. So most challenging is you never get to take the hat off, even in your private life. And also your family reflects what you do. So also just making sure um, we're people at the end of the day and we're humans and normal. So we might make a mistake and I'm the first to say I fail every day. And because I fail and own that, I believe I will continue to be successful. I will not pass the buck. And that's truly important because I'm setting the example for the other colleagues that I have the pleasure to work with day in, day out in the community that I represent. Can I, can I add on to that real sure. fast? Sure. 
That's Jump a, in. Well, you're, I mean, it's a good point that you bring up that you have to have that face every day. Because when people see you, they're not recognizing, okay, wait, this is Beth off, right? This is Beth at the grocery store with her son who won't go to the grocery. He's, my son's right over here now. He won't go to the grocery store with me anymore because he's like, mom, when we go in there, everybody wants to talk to you. But you have to realize that not everybody, he gets to see me every day. It's not a big deal at all, trust me, at all for him to talk to me. But you know, people who haven't, who have something, they've got one kind of thing that they want to tell you or just say thank you. That's the first face that they're ever seeing of the mayor. And you have to keep that in mind that while you're rushing in, you've got 15 minutes to go and get milk because you've got to go do this and you've got to make sure that you have the, this, the, the chicken on because you've got to get out of there in 45 minutes. They don't know that. And, and your job is not just to get the chicken on, but it's also to make sure that you're representing whatever brand that you have, the city that you're the leader of, or whatever company that you're the leader of. And that, that's a hard balance. And it does take a toll, but that is a really good point that you don't get to just take that face off because you know, I'm not I'm off the clock. You're and I would like to clock. add to that as okay. well that I never wanted to be powerful, to be honest with you. And I I know that that a lot of people would say, wow, she has a powerful influence. I always wanted to be an influencer. That was very important to me. I want to influence. I don't want to have the authority where I require people to follow me like a boss does. That's what we are in our, our businesses. We have the authority. I want to be followed because I've influenced somebody's ideas or their mindset about a certain situation. So we end up having kind of a powerful platform inadvertently, and we have to be very careful and respectful of that platform. So why did you want to be an influencer? And what, from what time did you want to be well, an influencer? Well, mostly because I usually think I have the best ideas in the room. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I want people to buy my ideas. And you cannot get people to buy into your vision if you don't influence. I've been around women who complain, and men, but a lot of times we've all been around women who complain that they can't get their point across or they can't get uh, people to follow them. And if people aren't following, then you're not leading. And so I've always wanted to learn how I read every book I can on leadership and influence. I want to learn how to influence people so that they come along willingly, not kicking and screaming. They'll buy into my vision if they see it and they get it. And they're like, I'm there. I'm in your corner, which is what happened with Women's Leadership Live, I will have to say I'm so grateful for the opportunity to be a sponsor. My for-profit business, Speed Cleaning, and then Cleaning for a Reason, it's their influence that made me want to follow and be a part of this. Okay, so I will ask each of you to give me the two most important qualities you personally think are the most important in being an influencer. Because you've all had the, you've had the experience of going into a room and having something you want heard and you can't get the attention of people or they don't really listen to you, what are the two most important things you can do in terms of being a successful influencer? So to be heard. Hands down, and I shared this earlier, it's the trust. And you don't walk into the room and have the trust. The trust starts right here after you leave the inaugural Women's Leadership Live Conference is going back into your communities, going back into your organizations, um, and, and getting involved. And that looks very different for every individual here, from uh, joining a community board to volunteering in your community and getting to know people. Um, and it just, every layer builds. Because I will share, there's a very small group of individuals that are involved in their community, in their region, in their states, in the nation, in the world. Um, three degrees of separation, but that, but that trust, and you build that by being present, by delivering in, in that moment. And the other is prepared. Here, you're preparing, um, and what that means is know the facts. N you know, if you are advocating, influencing for a policy issue, which we do day in and day out at the chamber, know what the opposition is. When I work with Mayor Van Dyne and, and her team and we're educating her on an item that's important for business, we state our board's decision, but I also have to educate her on what the opposition's saying. I can't just say, oh, don't worry, it, it doesn't matter because their facts are out there as well. So the, the, the knowledge and, and the trust. Before I, before I get to you, uh, Debbie, I'll, I'll say that one of my good friends is uh, Karen Hughes, who um, actually started at Channel 5 with me and ended up being um, named 
I think it, her title was special counsel to President George W. Bush. And she was an influencer over him, that's for sure. I mean, he really listened to her in a lot of ways. But um, she and I were talking one time, and she was a frequent guest on Meet the Press. And Karen knew her facts inside out, upside down. But every time Karen went on Meet the Press, before she went on Meet the Press, she sat down, she looked at who was going to be interviewing her that day. She Googled everything about them. She Googled everything about every single subject possible. She was completely prepared. So she was able to be a great influencer in a lot of ways because of her preparation. Just to follow up on what you said. I'm sorry. Debbie. Well, two things that come to my mind is, number one, if you want to influence others to ride your train, you better help them understand what's in it for them because we all listen to the same radio station WIIFM what's in it for me and if you want to in I'm sorry but that is human nature people so need true. to understand if you want to influence them well how's that going to make my life better and how am I going to benefit from it so you do have to help other people see how it will benefit them if they will come on board. And then secondly, I think one of the most important qualities, especially in the highs and the lows, is integrity. Because then you will not abandon your values and your priorities when you're in the depths of despair and things are not working out, or when you're at the height of success, when things are rocking along fabulously and there's all kinds of temptations to abandon your integrity. Okay, Mayor, we have saved you for last. What are the two most important things you can do to be a successful influencer? I say you have to have a track record. So people who think that they can walk in and all of a sudden take control and not have any kind of success to lead into that are fooling themselves. I mean, how many of you have hired uh, you know, a college graduate who comes in and has all the answers, <laughs> right? I mean, you have to have a track record of success that people have seen and they are comfortable with your leadership style that they understand that not only do you have integrity, not only do they have reason to trust you, but the key to me is also realizing that they know you have support. You're not walking into that room by yourself. I go into a con, I, I was the first female mayor ever elected in the city of Irving. And I am the only, I'm the only female in our city council. And I walk into that room and it has not been without controversy. Uh, not that, that I'm a female, but <laughs> quite the opposite. Some people claim that I have the only set on our council. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, you, you go in there, and when I look at, I look at elections, and I walk in there, my last campaign, I won 70% of our vote. So when I walk into that room, while they might not like me, while they might not like what I'm saying, while they might not have respect for me, it's impossible for them to ignore the 70% of our population that support me and that listen to me that I influence. And I think so having a track record and definitely having support, of, it, it provides you with power going into a room. Um, Debbie, um, the mayor and I were talking right before we came in here about the number of nonprofits, legitimate nonprofits who need help who need uh, to get a hearing in front of someone, um, and perhaps your corporation has a nonprofit arm. Um, but what are the best ways, what are the tools that nonprofits or nonprofit parts of corporations need to know about to get community support? Who wants to begin? <laughs> I'll, I'll kick off. Um, there is a 501c3 nonprofit organization getting started daily um, in your communities. And it's really important that that nonprofit understands, you know, the, that the um, government is also looking at what, what, it, what do you do? It is a business. So just because you're nonprofit doesn't mean you're not in the business to make money, um, but some people use it for um, not the best reasons. I would also encourage, there are many nonprofits out there that sometimes just need somebody to be a conduit. Uh, they've got a great idea or they have a service um, and they're trying to implement or just do a slight spin-off of a successful nonprofit. Um, and so our nonprofit leaders are consistently asking for revenue, asking for volunteer hours, and the population isn't giving more. The corporations aren't giving more. 
they're just realigning with what their workforce wants to not only give to, but where they want to volunteer their time. Right. Just earlier this week, our team had the privilege of working with one of our local corporations, and they had a contest internally where their employees could vote to rank, uh, you know, which nonprofits wanted they wanted to receive a ten thousand dollar grant. Ten thousand dollars is a lot of money for our local nonprofits, um, and it was the vote of the employees. And then the corporation engaged their um, key chambers and association representatives to come together to present the check and volunteer. And it was physical labor. We were planting trees, m putting mulch around trees, but it was that connectivity. And that was really the first time I have seen uh, not necessarily corporations asking their employees where they want their money to go, but actually a corporation connecting the dots and getting everybody there. Um, and you would believe that everybody would come and there would be hundreds of us. There was maybe 10, and I was really proud to say that of that, four were from our team. That sends the right message to the corporation, the nonprofit, and the community. That's, that's key. Yes. I think Debbie. of two things, okay. and one is very practical. When I started my nonprofit, the one thing I understood is it is a business and if people don't know you exist, your business will fail, and so will your nonprofit. So I immediately sought out Jeff Campbell, uh, Jeff Crilly with Real News PR, and I said, I can't afford to pay you, but will you mentor me? And he mentored me the first couple of years on how to get my story told in the media and how to approach the media and how to get on TV. And we've been on... Is he got you on GMT? Oh my goodness, he is <laughs> incredible. And and I say that, I'm, this isn't an infomercial, I say that because I understood the value of making sure we are noticed, that we are out right. in the media and that people know about this great service. So that, from a practical standpoint, I knew I needed to be able to connect with the media. And the media has been incredibly kind to us. They tell our story all over the United States nearly every single week. One of the main services is being featured in the story. So you've got to have media. You've got to connect with bloggers, people who write uh, for newspapers, and people who are um, on the radio, you have to connect with the media. And what I like to tell people is, you have not because you ask not. We think the media is going to knock on our door and say, I heard about you, can I interview you? It's not going to happen that way. You've got to knock on run, their run door and say, happen. have you heard about us? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, sometimes they do. For good reasons, they won't, generally. They, you've got to go and gotta find them, it. and you've got to make sure there's a connection. And um, so in the early days, I recognized that from a practical standpoint, we had to get the word out in okay. the media. And Beth, what was the question? I know. I've had a, a follow-up <laughs> answer I was trying to remember. Well, I, I was asking you, uh, if you are a nonprofit, how do you go about then oh, getting... Oh, one more thing to okay. add to that, because that's the practical side. Right. But the other side is transparency. There are, there are a dime a dozen the nonprofits true. that aren't transparent, and there are things they don't want you to know. And I have been 100% volunteer since the day my organization started. And I donate hundreds of hours every year. I've never taken a salary. I'm, we're completely transparent. Even my own cleaning business is two doors down from the nonprofit's office. And I won't even let the nonprofit hire my cleaning service to clean their office. I say, hire my competitor. Because I want to make sure people understand our nonprofit is about serving women and it's not about serving an individual's personal needs. Okay, we have about four minutes before we're going to take some questions from y'all, and so I wanna finish with a personal question, because I just, I, I, I'm interested in the lives of other women, and so I wanna know, how do you get it all done? What time do you get up? What, I mean, what, what's your day look like? What, Mayor, <laughs> start with you. You never get it all done. <laughs> Who said we you get never, it all done? I, that's what keeps you up at night. You know, it's 3 o'clock in the morning, you wake up, and you're like, oh, you start doing the checklist, right? And I don't know what time I wake up. I mean, sometimes I'll wake up at 5, and the first thing I do is I reach for my phone. Okay, what blew up today? You know, what news stories are out there? What am I going to have to respond to? I'll look at my schedule. Because quite honestly, I usually don't know my schedule until I look at it that day. Um, and it changes. It's so fluid. Um, and the first thing I do is I get my kids up and I make breakfast and I get them out the door. Um, and then we have meetings and then we have phone calls to make and then we've got emails to return. I get probably 600 plus emails a day. 
I, I, I try to get to them all, and a lot of times I don't. Um, people have my cell phone. I, I, I freely give out my cell phone all the time. So people will um, send me text messages. Sometimes I can respond, sometimes I can't. Um, getting prepared. There is never a shortage of people who reach out and ask for help. And at the end of the day, you know, you have to sleep. I know we think that we're super women and we don't need it. And that's usually the first thing to fall by the wayside, but you do need to sleep. You do need to carve out time for your family. Um, and I think it's so important now that you make them feel like they're a priority. And, and there will be times that I will be home and I'll, I'm making time and you get that text message and you answer it. Or you see that person calling, you've been waiting three days to, and you just see the look on your kids' faces to go, Mom. Um, but it's a balance, and it's a fight every day to balance. And I don't think that means that I'm failing. I think that means that I'm succeeding. Because if I didn't have that constant push and feel like I had to do more, I might as well not even be trying. Do you work out? Do you meditate? Do you pray? <laughs> All of the above? <laughs> I do just rush into a meeting count as working out and drying my hair. Um, I, I, not as much as I should. I used to, I used to what I would do at about 11.30 at night when the kids had gone to sleep, I would go running and do yoga. Um, and, I, you know, I hit 40, hit 45, and I don't have that energy anymore. And I, I, I need to make time for it. <laughs> that private time I'm talking about, it's all sounds good, but then you start filling in the day. And, and so I try, but not on a regular Debbie, basis. One of the things I do, because people ask all the time, how do you balance four businesses? And one of them's a nonprofit, which requires a lot of time. And from a practical standpoint, I use virtual assistants. I have an account with Upwork. I have an account with Fiverr. Best tip of the day, Fiverr, F-I-V-E-R-R.com. You can get projects done for you for $5, literally. I've had them do editing of video. I've had them create graphics, logos for $5. I use virtual assistants. I have Fiverr. See, <laughs> everybody write it down. Fiverr, F-I-V-E-R-R.com. I apologize if I sound like an infomercial, but these are practical things no, that are. I use to get stuff done. And, we never are finished. I, I mean, I understand that we're never finished. But when you do have a lot on your plate, you have to delegate. And that's one thing I've been good at is delegating. And I use virtual assistants. Upwork is another source. I have people in India, Romania, and the Philippines transcribing some of my videos, writing my blogs, because I have other businesses. And so outsourcing. Is, is a phenomenal way to get more done. And then I use my Google Calendar to schedule everything. So before I go to bed at night, I look and see what I have on my plate tomorrow. Right. I keep one appointment on my Google Calendar every day, and none of my assistants ever schedule anything before 10.30 in the morning because that's my workout time. And I do my Zumba, and if I have to cancel <laughs> it, I do, but Zumba, uh, working out to, uh, you know, Uptown Funk. <laughs> <laughs> so Google Calendar and then outsourcing little tasks that take a lot of your time. Okay. Um, I'll just <laughs> real quickly because we have got the, 25 the, seconds before the mayor, we have the Q&A. As the mayor shared, you never really do get it all done. I think as leaders, uh, there, there's always going to be that running list. Uh, you know, I have a husband who travels 75% of the time, two kids under the age of 10, um, and I run a very successful chamber of commerce um, in a community that's extremely active. And if I text you at, at 3 o'clock in the morning, she responds back into <laughs> wow. I do. My, my husband do. did say I could go to school you to do. get paid for being on call 24-7. <laughs> However, I would share, as I stated earlier, believe in the mission of what you do because it doesn't feel like you're working. You truly want to be committed. There is a compromise. There always is. Life is a puzzle. Um, every piece of the day fits. Sometimes that puzzle piece is missing um, or it doesn't get on there or it falls off the table and it looks like a hot mess. We all, y'all all know what I'm talking about. You put a puzzle together yes. before, um, but at the end of the day, it's work-life integration. It, that's really what it comes down to. It's work-life integration. Um, today, you know, I have a son that's playing in a baseball tournament, and I'm missing his games, and a daughter that's trying out for cheerleading. But to get them ready and be there for breakfast, to then go host guests at another event that we have in town, and then to be here today to support these co-founders in this powerful initiative of prepare to share powerfully. Um, and really inspire other women, especially those that are young professionals, which seems to be a buzzword, or millennials. Uh, I will share privately in the cone of silence, right? 
Um, I'm 34 years old. No. So, <laughs> shocker. You've gotten that far? I'm a millennial. <laughs> and wow. they're talked about as if they're a disease. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I would share, though, and I encourage my peers and tell other people, age is just a number. It's setting your mind to what you want to do and realizing your shortcomings. And what do you have to do to overcome those shortcomings to be on a level playing field? Sometimes that means you need to prepare a little bit harder than the next person, study, hire a virtual assistant, utilize social media, you know, partner up with a stakeholder, count on a friend, count on your family. Um, but it doesn't always get done, but I would surround yourself like you're doing in this room. Um, I have a personal board of directors. Uh, that was the best advice given to me. People that I've met um, through all stages of life, and some would say, ha-ha, she's really young. Um, but truly, I would say, if you don't have a personal board of directors, get it today. These are men and women that you can count on, and in any situation, and they keep your information private, and they know in that situation they are going to give you the best advice of what matters to Beth Bowman. And they are going to help you through that situation in a time where not everybody's so helpful. And the women in this room, some of them could be on your personal board of directors. And I'm very proud to say the co founders of Women's Leadership Live and these women that have truly made an impact starting in Texas. Um, I could call on and, and they would be there. And women running companies, running nonprofits, leading our communities are counting on these women that are willing to give back. And thank you for kicking it Great off here advice. in Irving, Texas. Absolutely. We have, we have a couple of mics in the room. We have a mic on each side of the room. And so if you have a question that you would like, what would you like to ask one of these women? What would you like to pick their brain about while you've got the opportunity? Because they have a no and lot I of knowledge. And I can't be first. So somebody <laughs> needs to take my place. All right. We have a, I'm always the one that jumps <laughs> Lovely woman there who is ready to give it, a, give it a shot. Well, my name is Rosemary. First, let me say I really appreciate what you guys are doing and what you've talked. Uh, I wasn't going to be able to stay for this session, but I'm glad I did. This was for me. I mean, everything else has been very, very powerful, but this spoke specifically to me. Why is that? Uh, I, um, I think I'm going to change this. I founded a nonprofit. I say I run a nonprofit, but I'm, I'm beginning to feel like I just founded it. Yeah. I don't know if I really run it. Um, I founded a nonprofit um, here that is based in Ulysses, really, it's a virtual office. But this nonprofit is um, imparting uh, educational skills and empowering young people, youth in Kenya, to follow their dreams, whatever that is. I followed mine, and that's what brought me to the States. And going back, I like to give what my experience was like to them. And that may not be mathematics, may not be sciences, but it is a skill. It is something that I believe if they can own their dreams and follow it with conviction, believe in who they are, they can go anywhere they want to go in the world. I'm not special, anybody can do it. Now, um, my question for you, and, and uh, um, Jane, I really admire you. At 60, my goodness, you're beautiful. <laughs> beautiful. Well, thank you. Hey, we have to compliment other women, thank because you. I was wondering, when did you do this 30 years that I was reading on this thing? But now, anyway, you said it, so. I started um, when I was eight. <laughs> oh, good. Anyway, I, so. I, I, I want to give you one honest answer to that question. In addition to maintaining skincare and all that, I honestly do think part of it is being active, being, being involved. I think that's so important. I think that, I, I really do. I think it makes a physical difference. Uh, just being involved in things, being open-minded, being open to new ideas, curiosity, all of that. I think it's huge. Sorry. That is great. I'll take that home. So, um, so I wanted to ask a question to these ladies. Uh, first of all, one, one of the things that made me start the journey that I did when I had a thriving corporate career here in Dallas was I came across a quote by Ralph Waldo Emerson, and it said, don't always go where the path may lead. Go instead where there's no path and leave a trail. And personally, I'd, I had never known anybody from my community out there that had come out to the States or had come out of there and made it in life and gone back to do 
to tell anybody or to tell us that there's a way out. So I felt, you know, I'm going to take that risk. And, uh, you know, it took a while to really work on it. And finally, I felt very peaceful about leaving my corporate, um, you know, pursuit and pursuing that, not for me, but for those lives that I hope when I die is how I'll be remembered, not by so much money that I made. Now, uh, the hardest part for me has been, and uh, listening to these three ladies, and especially Debbie, has been very inspiring, is being able to um, run a successful nonprofit. It is usually a very tricky, uh, I would say, field or business. And uh, having and finding the right people to be on your board, people that truly mean to be there to support you because they believe in your vision. And uh, I have gotten to a point where, like, uh, I'm sorry, Mayor, I forgot your yeah. name, but Mayor, uh, <laughs> you said something about, you know, and, and Pam Owens said earlier too, if, if you have people there in that wagon and they don't really mean good for you, you know, kick them okay. off. So and I've had to do I that. Now, to your question. Debbie, that's a great question. How do you this, find those people? This is critical. You have to surround yourself with people who understand your vision and are on board with your vision. But you also have to surround yourself with people who have talents and gifts that are different from your own. Your board should not look like you, and your board should definitely not think like you. And I have set out intentionally, which sometimes is painful, as Debbie Saviano will, will attest to, I have set out to put people on my board of directors who are willing to tell me no, and who are willing to tell me what they think, and they're not afraid if it's different from what I think. You cannot surround yourself, whether it's business or nonprofit, do not surround yourself with yes people. Because if you're trying to build something, first of all, you have to trust that you've chosen the right people. They have integrity, and they get your vision, and they are on your team. But you, and that they have the talent that you're looking for, whether it's the financial talent or the marketing talent, and not a bunch of yes people. So find people who will challenge you no matter what your decisions are and will help you make better decisions. That's so how would you like answer. to take a free safari to Africa without leaving your desk here and being a part of just being a mentor on that journey? Because I believe, uh, given that the, it's a US-based organization, but then the services are in Africa, it's like there is a, a huge room there for me being there and being able to maintain the authenticity and the legal aspect of it here, I definitely would love to find people that would um, be willing to do that. And, <laughs> and that's why I was, uh, that's why I was asking if, I so, would, so in I this would, room, if anybody, uh, if, if I'm a just, I would you compliment know. what Debbie said, because I run, not all, everybody understands that Chamber of Commerce is a nonprofit as well. I have 56 members on our board of directors and you constantly have to be in front of and communicating your vision of your nonprofit, your impact to your local community, and making sure and it's the humbling. business leaders know what their, the, what their role is. Um, I, I want to hook you two up after the segment because we only have about three or four minutes left and we have a couple more people who want to ask questions. So could y'all hook up afterward? Okay, go ahead. Hi, my name is Lucy, and I'm the founder of Lucy Bow Love. And I was wondering, because I know I understand that a lot of women have trouble asking for help. And even for myself, I feel like I have to contribute something before I can ask for something as a fair thing, because I want to do what I can to give back to others. So how do you ask in a way that when, especially when you're starting out, with something new or branching off into something else, how do you ask for help even if you feel like you don't have something to contribute at the time? Give first. Don't go to people with your handout. And a lot of people who think, even in the nonprofit world, that you can go to people with your handout because it isn't for yourself, it's for someone else. And that doesn't work in the business world and it doesn't work in the nonprofit world. Don't go to people with your handout. Go to people with your hand ready to take their hand and give them something, I want to whatever it is. What Debbie said again, um, help that individual on the receiving end of the question um, set you up for a successful yes or a no or a yes and. They need information, they need background and a concise one pager, talking points, 
with data options. to support what you're asking. Options. Mm -hmm. So and help them want to say yes or yes and. Okay. Thank you. And, and I'll give you one example from the media that kind of reflects that. We get tons of requests for stories, tons and tons. First of all, I'll tell you, make a personal connection with a reporter or whatever. Don't just send emails because we get thousands of emails. But the second thing is, is what you said, which is, yeah, I, I, you know, I mean, I would love to put your story on TV. If it's a good story, I'd love to talk about it. But at the same time, you have to give me something. You've got to give me good content yes. that's going to bring viewers to that television set. So it's a reciprocal relationship, even with the media. Go ahead. My name's Mandy Aguirre, and I'm from Salt Lake City, Utah. Welcome and to Irving. Thank you. It's glad to, I'm glad to be here. Um, and myself, my mother, and my daughter run a business called Razier Skin Care and Cosmetics. And my question is for the mayor. I'm very involved in politics and like to stay up to, you know, the, the current issues. Um, but I find it more challenging on a local level. You know, it's very easy on a national level to follow and even a state level. How do I get involved on a local level to be able to stay up to beat on what the candidates are running for, what their policies are? I find that's hard to find resources for that. That's a great question. Mm -hmm. We were just talking in the back about how you can get more people engaged. We just had a city, a, a local election. Um, a, what is it, two weeks ago now? Yes. Last week? And um, we have 90,000. We have, Irving is, is 92nd largest city in the country. So I mean, top 100. We've got 90,000 registered voters, 235,000 residents. We had 5,000 people who voted. And we reach out and we spend money and we do social media campaigns. We do, uh, you know, we talk to reporters. We, we put ads in papers. We, we put signs out. You send out direct mail pieces. Trust me, y'all are sick of getting these things, right? Those phone calls just as you sat down to eat. It's really hard to figure out how to engage. One of the things that you could do, a couple of things that you can do is one, go to a couple of city council meetings. They're boring, I understand. But maybe you don't even have to go to them. Maybe you could just watch, you know, a lot of them are, are, are have de um, on video on demand or you can watch them online. But go and see what's going on. Um, volunteer for a campaign. Find out somebody who's running that shares your ideals and your, your values and actually go and work for them. Um, um, try to get other people to run for election. Or, novel idea, run for an office. So many times you try to talk women into doing that and they don't, it's, it's almost like the question about, well, you wanna make sure that you're giving, giving, giving before you ask. So many women don't wanna run for office because, well, I'm not there yet, I need more experience, I need more support. Just do it. We have so few people who run and then you wonder why you have the politicians that you have. Uh, quite honestly, it's because the people who are really smart and successful and have other things to do in life, they don't want to waste their time doing it because they look at it as a waste of time. But if you really want to get involved, get involved in a campaign, whether it not be somebody's campaign or a subject matter campaign, or run for election. And trust me, as soon as you stick your name out there, people will find you. How, how many of you are with a company here or own your own business? Can you just raise your hand? Okay, so each of you in your communities have local boards and commissions. Also, you have a chamber of commerce. Research that chamber, and that can be another outlet to keep you posted on business issues um, in addition to social issues. And then you can decide where you are on that issue. Uh, and a chamber can also be an outlet of where you can get engaged and make a local impact. I wanna thank all of you for being here. I wanna thank our lovely panelists, I want to most of all thank Women's Leadership Live for yes. holding this today in order to help other women. I want to thank you for asking me to be a part of this. It's been very beneficial. And I hope that you will really take to heart what I suggested because it's very difficult, as you well know, to take an idea or a concept into action. And I do... I don't say things I don't think. I really do think that they have the tools in order to help you be able to do that. And you can pull one of them aside, one of the leaders aside, and say, so what, what can you do for me now moving forward from this conference that I've attended? Because it's the follow-up that will make the difference. So I think we're in a break now until 3.05, I'm told. 3.05, you should be back here. Um, thank you all for being here and listening. Appreciate thank it. Thank you, Jane. Thank you. You make